Oh dear, it's such a glorious day here in Fiji. I'm in Mommy Bay at the site of the, the famous Mommy Bay gun emplacements. And it really is such a spectacular day. The views from here, you've got the guns over there in the background, but on this hill, perched on this hill, but in the distance, you've got the spectacular view of Mommy Bay. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just something to die for. Anyway, so here I am at the museum. It cost me $8 to get in and uh, well worth it. Absolutely first class value. There is a museum attached to the entrance there, uh, full of incredible information about the Second World War, about the, the Japanese designs on Fiji. Anyway, so here we are, we're at the, uh, the mommy gun emplacements and over here is what is called the king's gun. These guns were, were actually legacies 
from the uh, First World War. The British had no use for them. And so they were used for coastal defences, not just in Britain, but around, around the British Empire. And uh, they were used on, for coastal defences. They were also used for um, merchant ships uh, during the Second World War that were in danger of being attacked by German ships. So um, these, these, these guns are essentially relics of the First World War. So you've got, um, you've got the King's gun. And just over here, we've got the Queen's gun. Over there, just over there, is a command post, or the command post for Mommy Bay, for the troops that were stationed here during the Second World War. Now I'll give you a bit more information about uh, these guns, but let me just show you very quickly the Queen's gun. There it is there. There we go, now I'm staring quite literally down the barrel of the Queen's gun. Anyway, these are, these are six inch guns designed to carry artillery that could reach almost 15 kilometers over there, deep into the, the bay in the distance. They could reach 15 kilometers, which is staggering. And they were built during the Second World War to counter what was likely to be a Japanese invasion of Fiji. Now that didn't take place. The Japanese were, quite, were heavily defeated in 1942 during the Battle of Midway. Uh, when things were touch and go, it could have gone either way, that battle. Um, but um, the Japanese had designs on the Pacific and on Fiji. And um, it was only after the end of the war that uh, documents revealed that, uh, yes, Fiji was definitely within their sights. And uh, so these guns were built, so they were put in, in place by the, uh, uh, the British guns, but, but uh, this whole, uh, these two guns were, were, uh, were put in place by the New Zealand army, because New Zealand thought that if, um, if Fiji had fallen, New Zealand was next. And then, indeed, that was the, the Japanese plan, that uh, take Fiji, and then, then New Zealand was next. And it was also important to the Japanese to disrupt the supply between America and Australia during the war. And so um, Fiji became absolutely pivotal in, the, in the, uh, the whole war effort as it was in the Pacific. It's no reason, it's no, sorry, it's no, uh, it, it isn't surprising that Fiji is called the hub of the Pacific because it's so centrally located that in the event of any uh, supplies from, from America reaching Australia, um, having uh, a defense establishment or defense a series of guns based in Fiji would have been absolutely essential defend, to defending not just Fiji, but defending the war effort, ensuring that supplies got through from America to Australia and, um, and to prevent F Fiji becoming a part of the, uh, the Japanese imperial empire, a part of what the Japanese uh, ironically called the greater prosperity, co-prosperity sphere. And so uh, this, oh, you know, this is just a small cog in a very uh, important role uh, during the Second World War. So let's, ha let's have a closer look.
So that behind me is the Queen's gun. Just over there at the top there is the, uh, the command post. I'm not sure what this is for. There's a, there's a hole up there. But I'm not sure what this one's, this building is for. There was a sign here that told you what this building was for. There was a sign. Just there that told you what the building was for, but uh, that's since uh, it's gone missing. So over here we've got the, the King's Gun. Look at the size of these things. They're just absolutely massive. There's the entrance just over there in the, uh, the visitor centre. I was reading some information at the visitor centre, which was quite funny. Um, occasionally they would have uh, these, uh, these dummy runs, these test firings, and it would shake up the whole area. So the New Zealand Defence Force, initially it was the New Zealand Defence Force that was in charge of this whole operation, supported, ably supported by Fijian soldiers, local soldiers. And um, that was taken over by the Americans later in the war. But um, the funny thing I was reading was that um, uh, when they test fired these guns, and of course they had to test fire them every so often, uh, they alerted the people living within an area of five kilometers that they were there were these test fires, these test firings going on, and uh, they were told to take off anything that might be uh, resting on walls, anything that might rattle and collapse and fall. And so they were told uh, to, be, to be prepared. There was going to be a test firing of one of these, these guns, either the Queen's or the, either the King's or the Queen's gun, and uh, they were told to be prepared and not be alarmed. And uh, they, they actually turned it into a bit of a, a bit of a day out because when there was a test firing, uh, later in the day they would hold a meke with uh, a traditional Fijian dance in the local Fijian village, and they would help, they would hold film nights where they would tell the locals what was what were the pro, what were the pro, what was the progress of the war, and uh, and so you know it, was, it became something of an event. Of course, these guns were never fired in in anger. The Japanese had. Uh, uh, the, Japanese, the intended Japanese designs on Fiji never materialized, but um, it just goes to show um, what might have happened. And of course, you know, uh, something else I was reading was absolutely fascinating. It wasn't just these two guns. Along the coast, there were, there was um, barbed wire placed along the coast at, uh, um, to deter any possible invasion. There were, uh, concrete bollards put in. There were machine gun posts. There was radar. There were, uh, um, there were, there were actually sea mi there was mines put in as well. Mines placed in the sea. Um, and so it was part of a huge elaboration. There were roadblocks. I remember reading at the visitor centre about uh, the uh, roadblocks. So it wasn't just these guns. It was a really well-coordinated and um, thoroughly thought out and well-advanced attempt to, to deter any possible Japanese invasion. So these things weren't taken lightly. And there we have it, guys. 
the mommy guns, the king and queen's gun here at mommy, high up on this hill in mommy. Two guns that defined a generation during the Second World War.